Hi guys, welcome to week six. We are jumping, if you have the book, to chapter 11, Foundations in Classical Theatrical Forms. We are back at the dance studio. All right, so we are covering early, early art forms of theater and dance um, in other countries. All right, I'm going to kind of get up on my tippy toes here to read my notes. No one knows how the theater really began, but at least since the 4th century BC, many theories have been offered to explain its appearance and rise to prominence. Religious ritual appears to be a likely major source, but theater was almost certainly preceded historically by music, dance, storytelling, oral history, and ancestor veneration, all of which contributed dynamically to the model uh, to the models theater took in its earliest forms. It can be argued that the first performance Performers in history were shamans, priests in ancient Asia, Africa, and Middle East, the Middle East, North America, and parts of Europe who communed with their gods and ancestors to heal disease and affect natural events through ritual and dance. Surviving hieroglyphics in Egypt indicate that religious theater existed there as early as 2500 BC and continued to be performed at um, Abydos in honor of the god Osiris for many centuries. What we know about these theatrical events is sketchy at best, short descriptions of what a priest performed. The Greeks in Athens created the earliest theater that has left us the texts of plays and theater architecture. The efforts of the Greeks, although grounded in religious ritual, are generally accepted as the oldest surviving dramatic studies of humanity as part of an ongoing public institution. So this is really just going to be a brief brief summary. Um, if you are majoring in theater, you will have an entire class, if not three to four classes um, of theater history, just covering from the earliest all the way um, up to today. So starting in classical Greece, um, classical Greece, in 534 BC, the city of Athens added contests for tragedy to its annual city festival honoring Dionysus, the god of wine, fertility, and ecstatic celebration. Subsequently, all theater presentations in Athens for over a century were produced only in honor of this god. Like the famous Olympic Games, theater for many years was a contest, at first among playwrights for the best set of tragedies, but later for best comedy and best actor, kind of like the Tonys, among other competitions. Nearly all of the Greek plays that have come down to us were first produced in the 5th century. We have 31 tragedies by three playwrights, plus one anonymous tragedy, and 11 comedies by one playwright. Although we are happy to have these remarkable plays, it is sad that probably a thousand or more plays have vanished from such a dynamic period of theater activity. Uh, theater was occasional, and one could not earn a living as a playwright or actor. All practitioners technically were amateurs, although they were highly skilled. Contributing talent or money to the theater of the festival was an important civic responsibility. Later, Greek theater professionalized when touring actors organized into guilds by the late 14th or by the late fourth century. At the beginning of the process in 534 BC, the actor and playwright were the same person. The early tragic playwrights such as Thespis in the 6th century performed their own plays which featured one actor and a chorus, a group of singer-dancers who in interacted with and responded to the actor. Later, a second and then a third actor were added, but all of the surviving tragedies were written for three actors who performed multiple roles, with a chorus whose size is usually estimated at 12 to 15. The chorus, however, might have begun with 50 performers, since that was the size of the traditional dithram, a choric presentation sung and danced in homage to Dionysus. The dithram is older than tragedy and is claimed to be a source for it. All actors and chorus members were strictly male, even though many characters and choruses represented females, and they performed in a large, typically circular performance space called an orchestra or a dancing place. The chorus entered and exited through the parados. At some point, a retiring space called a skein, our source for the words scene and scenery, were added upstage of the orchestra, and the audience of many thousands watched the action from a large theatron, a seeing place, on a hillside to which seats were eventually added. The action of tragedies, comedies, and other theatrical forms were performed with music and dance, singing, chant, and speech. All actors and chorus members wore full masks covering their entire head, and actors surely performed 
with dynamic movement and large gestures to reach such large audiences. The vocal and physical skills needed by the actors would have been impressive indeed. At the Dionysian Festival, Greek tragedies once fully developed were performed by three actors in three groups um, of three plays by three competing playwrights. After all the performances, a group of judges chosen from the ten tribes of Athens selected the set of plays they found the best. Sometimes a playwright told one story through all three plays, a trilogy that can be read as one three-part play today but other playwrights presented three different stories in their three tragedies. All Greek tragedies that we now possess except one are based on myths that were ancient even when the play premiered. Really, 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 really old. The story of Electra, a princess who conspired with her brother to murder her mother and the mother's lover, survives in tragedies by Aeschylus. Um, Sophocles and Euripides, and each tragedy has a very different focus and point of view. These three playwrights won numerous Dionysian contests, and some of their plays continue to inspire us in modern revivals, um, any productions of a play occurring after the original production. Some of the plays of Sophocles, especially Oedipus the King, which you will read, and Antigone, both explorations of guilt and crimes against divine law, Divine law are often studied as perfect examples of Greek tragedy and are frequently revived um, for courses in dramatic literature. Euripides left us many depictions of suffering and domestic conflict, perhaps most notably in Medea. Written in 431 BC, a tragedy of revenge in which the title character kills her children in order to punish her adulterous husband. Yikes. The Greeks also left us comedy. The satirical, ridiculous extravaganzas of Aristophanes are infused with fantasy and body jokes. His attacks on contemporary people whom he found corrupt, governmental practices he found misguided, or artistic endeavors he found inferior abound in his lyrical plays full of choric songs and impossible events. Often a political and social reactionary in his plays, Aristophanes staged the clouds as an attack on the, philos on the philosopher Socrates. Turning the page. Despite the importance of the plays and the significance of Greek theater in the Western theatrical tradition, we really know very little about Greek classical theater production. Since the playwrights left no stage direction, directions and most of the surviving information is sketchy. We are intrigued, for example, that some pass the hat. Street performers called mimes seem to include women in their companies, but the institutional theater never allowed women to perform. It was well after the Athenian decline that the Hellenistic philosopher Aristotle wrote his influential Poetics uh, in 335 BC, which stands as the first important examination of the tragic form. When combined with the remarkable philosophy, art, and architecture of the Greeks, the legacy of their theater inspires many play revivals, new plays, dramatic theory, uses of mask, theater, architecture, and contemporary scenic design. Classical Rome. The Republic of Rome conquered all Greek territory by 146 BC, but nearly a hundred years earlier, Romans had begun performing plays based on and inspired by the tragedies and comedies of Greece. Like their forebears, the Romans performed plays at religious festivals, but differed by dedicating the productions to any of their gods as long as the festivals honored one god at a time. Legend credits Livius Andronicus, the 3rd century BC, with the first plays and acting performances, but no plays survive until the comedies of Plautus and Terence. Roman comic playwrights adapted Greek comedies like those of um, Greek comedies, but eliminated the chorus. Although heavily influenced by Greek theater, the Roman theatrical should not be seen as strictly derivative. The Romans made many stylistic and content changes, and when we are able to compare fragments of the work, it is clear that the Romans provided numerous original touches that reflected their own values and culture. So they took the Greek work and then they built and tweaked and added their own um, things. Roman theater spaces and productions techniques also built on the Greeks, but the results were very different. Instead of using hillsides, the Romans erected freestanding theaters that surrounded the audience and performers while remaining open to the sky for light. These were the first theaters to focus the audience's attention strictly on the stage without distractions from the surrounding environment. I think that's what most of us think of when we think of um, Greek theater, but it's really um, the classical Roman theater that it's um, kind of like a football stadium open to the 
open to the sky, but they're seating all around. Romans introduced many devices that continue in modern usage today, such as stage traps, openings in the stage floor for ascents and descents, and vomitories, such a great word, stadium-like entrances for the audience, as well as a front curtain. Roman Latin also contributed many words permanently to our theater vocabulary, such as actor, auditorium, and um, histrionics. Like the Greeks, the Roman actors were male who performed in masks in large open spaces backed by a stone facade punctuated by a series of doors. The comedies of Plautus and Terence are rollicking farcical situation comedies focused on domestic um, pratfalls, misunderstandings, and mistaken identities. These plays, which were really musical comedies, although the music vanished long ago, influenced many playwrights beyond their time, especially in the European Renaissance. Plotus created the definitive mistaken identity play in the brothers Menachmus, wherein twin brothers are reunited after much confusion. The model of the masterful trickster is enshrined in the Formio by Terence. A wily servant tricks two stodgy fathers into accepting their son's romantic choices. Roman sitcoms in their form have continued into the present adapted as musicals. The Boys from Syracuse in 1938 and A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum in 1962. Movies, the Marx Brothers, Mel Brooks, and television shows. Roman tragedies, although rarely revived anymore, also influenced later periods. The tragedies of Seneca have Greek sources, but are extensively reconceived adaptions of Oedipus, Medea, and others. In Seneca's interpretations, the violence escalates. Seneca was fascinated by revenge as a motivation, and only he maintained something of a chorus. And uh, let me tell you, having read Seneca's version of Oedipus, it is extremely, extremely, extremely graphic. Kind of like watching a Tim Burton film. Um, many aspects of Elizabethan tragedy are often identified as Senecan. Like Aristotle in Greece, Horace provided a critical document, his poetic art that influenced the Italian Renaissance as much as Seneca and perhaps more than Aristotle. Medieval Europe. Well before the fall of the Roman Empire, imperial leadership had converted to Christianity, which ultimately dominated both religion and government in Europe after 500 um, AD. New church leaders such as Tertullian in 200 AD stringently attacked theater, acting, spectacle, and any kind of secular imaginative literature such as plays. Although there is evidence to support ongoing theatrical activity in Europe during the so-called Dark Ages, which were about 500 to 900 AD, there is no evidence of any formal legal theater until the 10th century. Ironically accepted theater practice was reborn in the church itself. Inspired by reading the Roman comedies of Terence, Heros of the I cannot say this word, Heros Vitha, a 10th century German canonist associated with a nunnery, creating fascinating Christian plays featuring dynamic heroines. Herosfitha's plays might have been performed in her lifetime, might not have been performed in her lifetime, but celebrations of famous stories from the Judeo-Christian Bible proliferated throughout Europe. Troops were presented as early um, as around 925. In, this, in these exchanges of dialogue and musical form, the singers or chanters represented characters from the Bible, such as the Three Marys at the Tomb of Jesus and a troop called Quem Queratis, Whom Do You Seek? For centuries, these and other types of liturgical dramas, plays included as part of the worship service, were performed in Latin by the clergy in many monasteries um, and cathedrals. The clergics also established an approach to staging that used an open space in front of an emblematic background. The system remained the chief model for nearly all medieval staging practices, both inside the church and in the community. Although liturgical plays continued to be performed after around 1200, many extravagant religious cycles or collections of plays were performed outdoors and were not confined to cathedrals and monasteries. Cycles were performed in the vernacular, the local langu language rather than Latin, and appeared throughout Europe. The plays in these cycles, often called mystery plays, were based on biblical stories and ranged from the creation of the world to the last judgment. One of the most famous religious dramatic forms of medieval Europe was the morality play, which depicted humanity's struggle with good and evil. Structured as a journey, most morality plays followed a generic character through his lifetime. The most famous morality play, however, Every Man in 1500, dramatizes only the final hours of a man facing his death. All morality plays were peopled 
with symbolic allegorical characters such as good deeds, pride, and gluttony, giving human characteristics to abstract ideas. Like the theater of Greece and Rome, the cycles were performed as part of religious festivals, most frequently in association with the holidays, Corpus Christi, Easter, and Christmas. Some communities also presented miracle plays or saints plays such as Mary Magdalene in 1500 that recounted the real lives of saints. The cycles drew on the community for actors and sometimes had a version of a director called a playmaster. The scenic support was often spectacular and full of wondrous events depicting transformations and miracles. The cycles and miracle plays grew in number and complexity lasting from 1 to 25 days until conflict over the Protestant Reformation led the Catholic Church to reconsider some of its practices. Protestant countries banned the cycles and all religious plays as corrupt in the 1500s. Despite the official ban, some cycles continued for a while, but only Spain continued to perform them until the 18th century. Most playwrights and actors of medieval Europe remain anonymous to us, but we know much about staging practices because many detailed accounts and prompt books, books that contain scripts, detailed stage directions, and production practices. The prompt book from the Lucerne, Switzerland cycle also includes a drawing of the settings laid out in the town square. Some productions use processional staging, moving wagons or pageants, think of floats on a parade, traveling through the streets carrying actors and scenery to perform in various locations. Classical India. Before the medieval Europeans rediscovered theater, Sanskrit plays appeared in Hindu culture and suggested directions that later Asian theater would take. A detailed document by Bar Barahada, um, the Natyasatra, sometimes translated as Doctrine of Dramatic Art, which appears to predate the most important surviving Sanskrit plays, outlines the principles of performance, staging, and dramatic form as practiced in India and applied to Sanskrit plays. The type of theater space varied, but it was decorative and symbolic rather than scenic. The actors performed on a mostly open stage. Unlike the Greek and Roman theater, women often participated as actors in Sanskrit plays and performed prominent roles. Most of the stories of Sanskrit drama are based on epic Indian literature, such as the Maharajada and the Ramanya, which featured heroic adventures of gods and mortals. The dramas are structured organized around rasas, moods or sentiments, rather than action and event as we see in typical Western plays. All the plays end happily after a nearly free-form journey through time and space. By the 1200s and hastened by an Islamic invasion of India, the creation of Sanskrit plays ceased, but Sanskrit contributed important drama that is still regularly studied and occasionally performed in both India and the West. Before the decline of the Sanskrit plays, another religious theatrical form based on ancient epics appeared in India called Kutiyatum, which was performed in temples and can still be seen by modern audiences. It appears to combine elements of the Nadia Yastra, including using actresses with folk traditions. By 1700 or so, another remarkable dance drama, Kathakali appeared and is now often identified as the dominant classical theater of India. This all-male epic theater features some of the most incredible makeup and costumes found in any theatrical experience, and its complex system of gestures bears resemblance to the performance descriptions in the Nadia, Nadia Stra. Although little text exists in Kathakali, singers provide a narrative. Classical China Although some kind of theatrical activity in China seems to have been brewing as early as the 8th century, there is no evidence of professional theater before the 10th century, after which differing forms of plays and theatrical styles developed in both northern and southern China. By the 13th century, as mystery cycles were flourishing in Europe, the first great Chinese plays appeared identified as Wuan plays since they were written during the Wan dynasty. Many of these plays fascinated the public and continued to be read and adapted in both Asian and Western culture. Chinese culture apparently produced no tragedy for the stage, but most of the plays featured a mixed tone like Sanskrit and might end either happily or sadly, but with a sense of poetic justice. Virtue is rewarded, evil is punished, instrumental music of strings, flutes, and percussion was important, and many of the plays included solo singing. What is perhaps most striking about classical Chinese theater, however, is the approach to performance, which was highly stylized with movement, dance, chant, and music. 
Different Chinese regions developed individual styles. In the early 1800s, Chinese artists combined many of them to form what is now known as Chinese music drama or the Beijing opera. The earliest known stages were nearly or were nearby bare thrusts except for a carpet, a table, and two chairs. This configuration remains traditional for music drama. A performance could be indoors or out, but the stage was sometimes roofed. The traditional space had only two doorways upstage, one for entrances, the other for exits. The musicians and stage attendants remained on stage with the actors throughout. All right, I have three minutes. Can I get through this? I'm going to try. All right, classical Japan. Toward the end of the Wan Dynasty in China, the first great classical theater of Japan, no theater developed in the court of the shogun in the feudal samurai system of the late 14th century. No, uh, spelled N-O-H, has always maintained music and dance as part of the dramatic presentation. Two early master actor playwrights created and perfected the no theater. Khan Ami is credited with defining No's essential form, and his work is represented well by Sotoba Komachi, a play in which an aging woman is possessed by the spirit of her dead lover. No theater traditionally presents a varied program of plays reflecting different moods and styles. The leading character is masked, but most other characters are not. The characters perform in front of onstage musicians playing flute and percussion and a chorus, which often speaks for the main actor, although we also hear the main actor's voice. Actors are traditionally male, even though um, most of the characters are female and assisted on stage by neutrally costumed stage attendants whom the audience pretends are not visible. The gestures of actors are highly stylized and often accentuated by remarkable use of fans. No continues to be performed and new audience members are struck by the colorful costumes, enigmatic masks, and slow, stately, ritualistic approach to performance. The most popular classical Japanese form is kabuki, which began in 1603 through the dancing performances of the priestess Okuni. Although kabuki was begun by a woman and the form was dominated by female performers for over 25 years, the government banned women from kabuki in 1629. It has been traditionally performed by men ever since with female roles or onagata performed by men who specialize in this form of cross-dressing. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Did I get through all of that? Or did I just think that I got through all of it? <gasps> I did. About 20 minutes. Okay, so I have to go teach a tap class in one minute. Um, this week we are working on our papers, theater and or um, research into a community theater or professional theater. Those papers are due by October 4th at 11.59 p.m. and I will do my very, 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 very best to get them back to you as soon as possible. Remember, um, you do have an opportunity before the end of November to um, rewrite or revise your plays to get a better grade. Um, the only way to learn how to write papers, guys, is by doing it. I've been there. Um, so, um, yes, this week, Ask me any questions. Please remember that your paper should be written in the third person. Um, double spaced, 12 point font, either Times New Roman or um, Arial. Make sure you have all of your information in the left hand corner. Your name, my name, the class name, the date, um, a header with your last name and the page number, a works cited page. Do not use contractions and explain the why. Don't make me ask, you know, okay, I wonder what they meant by this. Just state it, okay? That's what I'm looking for. You guys are going to be awesome. Have a good week.